святыня я моя, имя святое Его, благословение Сего. The title of my talk this evening is The Eucharistic Sacrifice, Who Offers What to Whom? First of all, may I express thanks to His Beatitude, Metropolitan Theodosius, who kindly gave his blessing for me to address you here tonight. And I would also like to express gratitude to the clergy of this cathedral church for their kind and warm welcome. The general theme of our conference, Orientale Lumen IV, is the Eucharist and Christian unity. And so I would like to begin tonight with a prayer for unity from the liturgy of St. Basil, a prayer that is said immediately after the threefold Amen at the Epiclesis. Unite us all, as many as are partakers, in the one bread and cup, one with another, in the communion of the one Holy Spirit. Tonight, let us reflect more particularly about the Eucharist as an offering or sacrifice. Sacrificial language pervades the text of the Byzantine liturgy. Already we hear the note of sacrifice in the rite of preparation, in the proscomedie. As the Eucharistic loaf is cut, the priest says, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter the Lamb of God is sacrificed. Or again, for example, at the great entrance in the liturgy of St. James, in the hymn that we use on Holy Saturday, we sing, The King of Kings, Christ our God, comes forth to be slain. At the great entrance in the liturgy of the pre-sanctified, we use the words, Behold the mystical sacrifice, all completed is born on high. The celebration in the text of the liturgy is described as a sacrifice of praise, a spiritual sacrifice, a reasonable sacrifice, an unbloody sacrifice, that is, a sacrifice without the shedding of blood. In his classic commentary on the liturgy, St. Nicholas Cavasilas, whose memory we were celebrating this morning, says, It is the accomplishment of the sacrifice that forms the essential element in the mystagogy. What then is meant by this ever-present language of sacrifice? Let us begin tonight by reflecting on three phrases in the liturgy. First, the words of the deacon to the priest before the initial blessing. In Greek, he says, Keros tu piise to kirio. And I quote the Greek because this is a phrase that can be translated in 
more than one way. In the OCA translation of the Divine Liturgy, put out in 1967, it is rendered, it is time to begin the service to the Lord. The rendering which I would prefer, however, runs, it is time for the Lord to act. The phrase is, in fact, a quotation from Psalm 118, 119 in the Hebrew numbering, verse 126. And most renderings of the Bible translate this psalm verse in the way that I have suggested. It is time for the Lord to act. The other translation, it's time to begin the service to the Lord, is possible, but the second translation, it is time for the Lord to act, is incomparably richer. What we learn from this phrase very clearly is that the divine liturgy is not primarily our action, but Christ. The true celebrant at every liturgy is the unique high priest, Christ himself, present in our midst invisibly, yet with total actuality and immediacy. And it is this point that the true celebrant at the divine liturgy is Christ, which provides us with a vital clue to the nature of the liturgy as a sacrifice. Christ is the true celebrant. As the clergy say to each other when they exchange the kiss of peace before the creed, Christ is in our midst. Why, I wonder, do we not exchange the kiss of peace also among the congregation? But that's not my theme tonight. <laughs> so then, here is the true key to the whole question of the Eucharist as an offering or a sacrifice. Christ is the celebrant. As St. John Chrysostom says... In words that Father Robert Taft quoted this morning, the priest merely lends his hand and provides his voice. <clears throat> that reminds me of an occasion some little time ago when I had to go and celebrate the liturgy in a Greek parish in England some distance from Oxford. And... Just before I was due to celebrate the liturgy, I fell and broke the scaphoid bone in my left hand. And that is not a course of action that I would recommend to you, because it's a bone that only heals with very great difficulty. So I arrived to celebrate the liturgy with only one hand. And I found that the priest in the parish was extremely worried because he had completely lost his voice. However, <laughs> between the two of us, we managed to celebrate the divine liturgy. One of us lent his hand and the other provided his voice. <laughs> Then my second phrase from the prayer of the cherubic hymn before the great entrance. The celebrant addresses Christ. Sigario prosferon que prosferomenos que prostecomenos que diadidomenos. 
Thou art the one who offers and is offered, who receives and is distributed. This phrase has an ancient history. The opening words, Thou art the one who offers and is offered. Or if you prefer, you are the one who offers and is offered. Though I am, in the matter of liturgical translation, prejudiced, I am not fanatical. So you may use which you prefer. <laughs> These, the opening words, come from a sermon of Theophilus, Patriarch of, An of Alexandria, delivered on Holy Thursday, on, to be exact, the 29th of March in the year 400. They are often attributed to Theophilus' nephew, St. Cyril of Alexandria, but in fact his uncle used them first. The words are first found in the text of the liturgy around 800, though they are not to be found invariably in the full form as today until the 12th century. Incidentally, this uh, prayer before the great entrance was never said aloud in the hearing of the people. It was always a private prayer of the celebrant. The one who offers and the one who is offered. As in the first phrase, it is time for the Lord to act. Christ is envisaged as the true priest, the true celebrant. He is both offerer and offering. So here we begin to see our answer to the question, who offers what? The answer is, Christ offers himself. Then, a third phrase, immediately before the epiclesis. The celebrant says, as the deacon elevates the holy gifts, Tasa ecton son si prosferontes catapanta ke diapanta. Offering thee thine own from thine own in all things and for all things. The origins of this phrase are yet more ancient than the second phrase. These words go back at least to St. Irenaeus, writing in the second century. He says, we offer unto him what is his own. There is yet earlier a scriptural source in 1 Chronicles 29:14. For all things come from thee, and from thine own have we given thee. Again, this is not an altogether easy phrase to translate. First, notice that the correct reading is offering the participle not we offer, the main verb. Offering is the reading preferred by Panagiotis Trembellas in his critical edition of the Greek liturgy. And indeed, it is the reading that we have adopted in Britain, in my own diocese of Thyatira, in the translation that we put out in 1995. When the priest's words here are put in a participial form, not we offer, but offering, this shows 
that his words lead directly into the people's response, we sing thee, we praise thee. Those two, the priest's exclamation and the people's response, form a single unity. Another point we may notice is that the later part of the phrase is neuter in all things and for all things. Catapanta ke diapanta. You can translate the prepositions in a wide variety of ways. But what we should note is that we are offering not just for all persons, but for all things. If we merely say we offer for all, the obvious sense would be for all persons. So at the risk of seeing a bit pedestrian, let us say things. Because what is being said here is that the Eucharistic offering is a cosmic offering. A, the total creation is involved. This has important ecological implications. In using this phrase, we are stressing our responsibility for the environment. And this is very much a burning theme at the present time. So in using this phrase, we offer in all things and for all things, we are taking up the opening part of the anaphora, which is a hymn of praise for the total creation. So in the light of these three key phrases, let us now attempt an answer to our question, who offers what to whom? The first answer is, we offer, priest and people together. That is clear from the third phrase, offering thee thine own from thine own. The Eucharistic offering, in its most external and obvious sense, is our offering. What do we offer? Here, let us attempt a fourfold answer. Nothing is simple. First, we offer bread and wine. And notice here that in making this offering, we <clears throat> are expressing our own <clears throat> human creativity. We bring to God not just sheaves of wheat, but bread. Not just bunches of grapes, but wine. What we offer to God are the gifts of the earth, not in their original state, but refashioned by human hands. I thought of the meaning of this when some years ago, returning from France, I bought myself a liqueur made from nuts. And I bought it because it had the picture of a squirrel on the label. And I like squirrels. <laughs> At any rate, the red ones. I thought about this as I looked at this bottle later. I thought, yes, squirrels collect nuts. They bury the nuts. They forget where they've buried them. And they then quarrel with other squirrels about whose nuts belong to who. <laughs> These are all very much human activities. 
Papa. <laughs> but one thing squirrels don't do, and that is make a liqueur out of nuts. <laughs> Only human beings have the ability to transform nuts from their natural state into a liqueur. Actually, the liqueur was very nasty. <laughs> I would far have preferred the nuts in their original state. <laughs> which only goes to show that in a fallen world we have the ability as humans to make things worse rather than better. <laughs> so then animals live in the world and glorify God by being themselves. But human beings made in the image of God have the gift of self-awareness, conscious thought. We humans can alter and reshape the creation. We can offer it back to the creator, refashioned. We can offer it back consciously with deliberate praise and thanksgiving. The animals cannot do this. Or perhaps we should qualify this, perhaps we shouldn't make too sharp a contrast between humans and animals. The animals can do this only to a very limited degree. Bees make honeycombs, beavers build dams. The liturgical texts indeed imply that animals have souls. But it is true that humans through their power of self-awareness, have the ability to refashion the creation in a far more subtle and complex way than the animals. So then, in the divine liturgy, we are expressing our human vocation to act as priests of the creation. We give the creation a voice. We render it articulate in praise of God. This is beautifully expressed by Leontius, Bishop of Cyprus, writing in the seventh century. Through heaven and earth and sea, through wood and stone, through relics and church buildings and the cross, through angels and men, through all creation, visible and invisible, I offer veneration and honor to the creator and master and maker of all things and to him alone. For the creation does not venerate the maker directly and by itself. But it is through me that the heavens declare the glory of God. Through me the moon worships God. Through me the stars glorify him. Through me the waters and showers of rain, the dew and all creation venerate God and give him glory. Through me we humans are the essential link in the great chain of being. We give creation a voice. We offer the world back to God. And that we do supremely in the Eucharist. So then, first we offer bread and wine. But what I've just been saying applies not to bread and wine alone, but far more broadly to our relationship vis-a-vis -vis the world as a whole. 
So we can expand our first answer. We do not offer just bread and wine, but secondly, we offer the total creation in all things and for all things. So the bread and wine symbolize the whole created order which we are offering back to God in the liturgy. Our Eucharistic offering, then, is the equivalent in the New Covenant of the Old Testament offering of first fruits. By offering first fruits, the Jewish worshiper called down the divine blessing upon the total harvest. So in the Eucharist, by offering to God bread and wine, we call down the divine blessing upon the total creation. This is a theme much emphasized by St. Irenaeus. But now we should give also a third answer. We offer bread and wine, we offer the total creation, but thirdly, we offer ourselves. We do not offer only what we have, but what we are. We are part of the Eucharistic offering. This is already emphasized in the Old Testament. In Psalm 40, that is cited in the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 10. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, See God, I have come to do your will. This is the offering that God wants from us most of all. That we should offer ourselves, soul and body, as a living sacrifice to him. And this is part of the meaning of the Eucharistic offering. In the words of St. Augustine, in the very thing that the church offers, she herself is offered. It is the mystery of yourselves that is laid on the Lord's table. It is the mystery of yourselves that you receive. There you are on the table. There you are in the chat. Augustine's words are fulfilled in the liturgy, more particularly after the communion of the people, when the particles on the pattern representing the living and the departed are placed in the chalice, as the celebrant says, wash away, Lord, the sins of those here remembered with thy most precious blood. That's exactly what Augustine is saying. There you are in the chalice. So we offer bread and wine. We offer the whole creation. We offer ourselves. But we have to say something more. Fourthly, we offer Christ. As St. Cyril of Jerusalem says, we offer Christ sacrificed spiritually for our sins. Our self-offering becomes Christ's self-offering. Yet having said all this, we've said much less than half the truth. As well as saying, we offer, we need to say, secondly, 
Christ offers. Christ offers himself. Our offering only has value because it is taken up into his. And that was exactly what was made clear in our three phrases. It is time for the Lord to act. It's his action, his offering rather than ours. Thou art the one who offers and who is offered. It is Christ who is both the offerer and the offering, both priest and victim. In the words once more of St. Augustine, he is the priest, himself the one that offers, himself also the offering. Ipsi offerens, ipsi et oblatio. The corollary of this is that every celebration of the Eucharist is the Last Supper. If Christ is the celebrant, then at the Divine Liturgy, you and I are present as the disciples were at the Last Supper. This is a leitmotif in John Chrysostom. Believe, therefore, that even now it is the same supper at which he himself sat down. For the one is in no respect different from the other. It cannot be said that the one is made by man, the other by Christ. But both the one and the other are his own work. When, therefore, you see the priest giving the sacrament to you, do not think that it is the priest who is doing this, but that it is Christ's hand that is stretched out. It's equally clear in the third of my phrases, thine own from thine own. All that we offer comes from God. Apart from Christ's self-offering, we can make no offering at all. Such then is the answer to the first part of our question, who offers what? We offer Christ. Christ offers himself. How shall we answer the second part of our question, to whom is the offering made? Once more, there is no single simple answer. We can give a fourfold answer. First, in the divine liturgy, Christ offers himself to the Father. We may think of Christ's words in his high priestly prayer at the Last Supper, John 17, verse 13. Now I come to thee. That is what is happening in the divine liturgy. Christ offers himself to the Father. But that is not a complete answer. Secondly, let's remember the phrase from the prayer during the hymn of the cherubim. Thou art the one who offers and is offered. The one who receives. Ke pros de komenos. So Christ not only makes the offering, but he receives it. So we may say in the liturgy, Christ offers himself to himself. But God the Holy Trinity is indivisible. And so the Eucharistic offering in the third place is made not just to the Father, not just to Christ. The Eucharistic offering is made to the Holy Trinity. This was 
said also this morning by Father Robert Capp. And this truth is stressed in particular by the Council of Constantinople that met in May 1157. And that council, unfortunately very little known, is the chief authority in the Orthodox Church for the doctrine of the Eucharistic sacrifice. The council emphasized specifically, yes, that the Godhead is indivisible, so Christ could not offer sacrifice to the Father without also offering it to himself and to the Holy Spirit. And the same teaching is found in the Roman Mass, which contains, among other things, the prayer Sustipe Sancta Trinitas, receive Holy Trinity. The offering is made to the Trinity. So, to whom? To the Father, to Christ, to the Trinity. But there's also a fourth answer. The offering is made to us. Christ offers himself to us in Holy Communion. And that is emphasized again in the prayer during the hymn of the Cherubim when it is said, Thou art he who offers and is offered, who receives and is distributed. So the offering is made also from Christ to us, not only by us to God. I remember when I was at school, our history master had a favorite phrase which could be applied here. Whatever he was discussing, he used to say to us, it all ties up, you see. It all ties up. And so it does in the teaching about the Eucharist. But now I'd like to come to a further question before I close. What is the relation between the Eucharistic sacrifice and the sacrifice on the cross? If you've begun to feel a little bewildered by the variety of answers that I've so far given, let me assure you that worse is to follow. <laughs> In the words of Al Jolson, you ain't heard nothing yet, folks. <laughs> the basic answer to this last question is, as before, given by the Council of Constantinople in 1157. Around that time, in the imperial city, a deacon called Sotirikos Pant Evgenos, who was patriarch-elect of Antioch, put forward the following view concerning the Eucharistic sacrifice. Christ, he said, died once for all. F. Hapax, the key word used in Romans 6.10 and Hebrews 7.27. Christ died once for all. Therefore, said Sotirikos, the Eucharist is not a real sacrifice, but it is the, merely the memorial, the anamnesis of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. The Eucharist, said the deacon, does no more than recall the sacrifice on the cross. In an imaginary or rather an iconic fashion. Fantasticos, imalon iconicos, was his phrase. And here, Sotirikos Pantevgenos clearly anticipates the 16th century reformers. 
This view was condemned and anathematized by the 1157 Council, and the anathemas were incorporated in the Synodicon of Orthodoxy, used on the first Sunday in Lent in some but not all places. There are about 60 anathemas in that service, though interestingly, there are no anathemas concerning the filioque or the papal claims. But poor old Soterikos Pantevgenos gets anathematized, <laughs> and he was never actually appointed to the throne of Antioch. So the moral of that story is, if you hope for high office in the church, don't embark on speculative theology. <laughs> what the Council of 1157 said to Soterikos was this. Applied to the Eucharist, the term anamnesis bears not a weak but a strong sense. The Eucharist is not a bare memorial, a mere mental recollection, a mere imaginary and iconic representation. On the contrary, the Eucharist is a making present of the past, not representation in a weak sense, but inserting a hyphen in a strong sense, representation, making present once more. This, said the council, is what anamnesis means. Remembrance becomes reality. Exactly as is said in the Anglican Roman Catholic discussions of the Archic Commission, Perhaps one of the best sections in their report concerns the Eucharistic sacrifice. Anamnesis, they said, is making effective in the present an event in the past. And in their elucidation, they add, the once-for-all event of salvation becomes effective in the present through the action of the Holy Spirit. Developing this point, the 1157 Council excludes three possibilities. First, it excludes, as I've just said, the notion that the Eucharist is just a bare mental recollection of the sacrifice of the cross. That is wrong. Anathema. Then, secondly, however, they say, the Eucharist is not a repetition of the sacrifice of the cross. For Christ's sacrifice on the cross is unique and unrepeatable. The 1157 Council agrees fully with Soterikos Pantevgenos over F. Hapax, once for all. Thirdly, the 1157 Council says the Eucharist is not a new sacrifice, for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross is complete. So, if it's not a bare recollection, if it's not a repetition, and if it's not a new sacrifice, what is it then? What other possibility remains? The 1157 Council simply says that the Eucharistic sacrifice is identical with the sacrifice on the cross. Not a bare recollection, not a repetition, not an addition, but identical. In their words, the sacrifice is unchanged, one and the same. 
But the question arises, how? One of my all-purpose anecdotes concerns Thomas Carlyle, great Victorian, and his mother. One Sunday, Thomas Carlyle returned home from the morning service in a bad temper. I cannot understand, he said to his mother, why they preach such long sermons. If I were a minister, I would go up into the pulpit and say no more than this. Good people, you know what you ought to do. Now go and do it. <laughs> I, Thomas, said his mother, and would you tell them how? It's easy enough to tell people what, much harder to tell them how. And does the 1157 Council satisfy Carlyle's mother? Perhaps not. <laughs> she is a difficult old lady. <laughs> but some light is shed on this matter by the theologian behind the 1157 Council, Nicholas of Methoni, who in his turn is drawing on John Chrysostom's homilies on the Hebrews. And Nicholas of Methoni's key concept is the heavenly altar. The heavenly altar. He's thinking of four texts in particular in Hebrews. 727, Christ offered sacrifice once for all when he offered up himself on the cross. Then Hebrews 4.14, after his self-offering on the cross, Christ as our great high priest has passed into the heavens. Hebrews 9.24 There in heaven he is continually made manifest in God's presence on our behalf. Hebrews 7.25 There he ever lives to make intercession for us. Nicholas of Methoni puts these four texts together and comes up with the following theory concerning the Eucharistic sacrifice. Christ's unique and unrepeatable act of self-offering on the cross is continued, not repeated, by his heavenly intercession. In other words, we've got to bring together three factors. Christ's self-offering on the cross, Christ's self-offering at the earthly altar in the liturgy, and the connection between those two things the cross and the earthly liturgy, is established by a third factor, Christ's self-offering at the heavenly altar. We are not to try and relate the earthly liturgy as an event in time directly with the cross as an event in time. Because in historical time, these two events are separated. We can't just make a straight line, a horizontal connection. But we should see Christ's self-offering on the cross as continued in his self-offering at the heavenly altar. And then we should see the divine liturgy as a manifestation in time of the heavenly offering. So we shouldn't just have a straight line, but we have to have a triangle. 
with the heavenly altar coming in, in eternity, between the events in time of Christ's death on Calvary and our celebration of the earthly liturgy. So the earthly liturgy is a manifestation, emphanismos, or a showing forth, digma, of the heavenly liturgy. Exactly what is made present in the holy liturgy is the heavenly liturgy. The divine liturgy is heaven on earth. As St. Gerbanos of Constantinople says in the first chapter of his commentary, Ecclesia est in epigios uranos, the church is an earthly heaven. In the words of Nicholas of Methoni, the mystery of the sacred rite that is celebrated by us daily is a showing forth of that eternal offering in heaven. So, the earthly liturgy is a sacrifice because it is a manifestation of the heavenly liturgy, which in its turn is the extension in eternity of Christ's sacrificial self-offering made once for all upon the cross. I do not know whether that would satisfy Carlyle's mother, but it is the best that I can do this evening. Possibly you will feel that I have not, after all, succeeded in producing a white rabbit out of my Kalamavkion. <laughs> but I shall not attempt any more conjuring tricks this evening. Let me end, rather, with the liturgical testimony of that great Eucharistic priest, St. John of Kronstadt, testimony striking in its simplicity. The Eucharist is a continual miracle. In the words, take, eat, and drink, there is expressed God's overwhelming love for humankind. O oh, perfect love, O oh, all-embracing love, O oh, irresistible love, what can we give to God in gratitude for such love? Святое Его.